Uh, welcome to ICANX Talks. I am Lan Fu, a, a professor in physics from the Australian National University. I will be your host tonight for the ICANX Talks. So today we'll be continuing the month theme on um, Beyond Science. And our speaker for this ICANX 116th edition is Professor Anne Roberts from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Join me today, we in the panel will be Assistant Professor Michael Scott from Virginia Tech, Professor Jian Dongye from Nanjing University, and to Dr. Jin Yong Ma from the Australian National University. So it's great, great pleasure for me firstly to briefly introduce you our speaker tonight, Professor Anne Roberts from the University of Melbourne. Professor Anne Roberts obtained her bachelor degrees in science with honors and physics and a PhD degree in physics from the University of Sydney. After a position as a postdoc associate in the School of Electrical Engineering at Cornell University and took up as academic, uh, academic position in the School of Physics at uh, the University of Melbourne, Professor Roberts has diverse research interests in physical optics and uh, Photonics. She is a fellow of the Australian Institute of Physics, the Optical Society, and SPIE, and a former president of the Australia and the New Zealand Optical Society. Professor Roberts is a chief investigator in the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Transformative Metal Optical Systems. And tonight, tonight, Professor Anne um, Roberts will be talking about phase contrast imaging for nanophotonics. Welcome, Anne, to the stage. So thank you very much, Lan. I guess I'll share my slides now. So all good? Yes, we're good to go. Okay. So thank you very much, Lan and Alice and uh, all of the organisers for the opportunity to speak at this uh, very interesting event. So um, just to explain a little bit more about where I'm from, I'm at the University of Melbourne and uh, Melbourne is down in the uh, southeast uh, corner of Australia. And this is actually a very interesting map of Australia because it shows all of the lands of the uh, traditional owners, the indigenous uh, people of Australia. And I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where I am sitting and it's also the, the same traditional owners of the um, lands of the Parkville campus of the University of Melbourne. So they are the uh, Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend those respects to any uh, First Nations people who are viewing this presentation. So another interesting thing that's happening in uh, Melbourne is the fact that today is in fact a public holiday. And the sole purpose of this holiday is to celebrate the fact that there is a big game of Australian rules football uh, happening tomorrow. Uh, that will be the grand final that's going to be played between the uh, Sydney Swans and the Geelong Cats. So, uh, so uh, it seems a little bit unusual, but um, we've been given a, a holiday to um, prepare ourselves for this very significant event in Melbourne. So to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, I'll start off by just explaining a little bit about the context of uh, phase contrast imaging and image processing more generally, and uh, also some of the applications that are uh, influenced by it. Um, I'll also spend some time talking about uh, the uh, optics of all optical image processing. And there are two different strategies that have been uh, explored for um, investigating this. And uh, there is a particular aspect that we've been exploring. And I'll say more about that when we come to that uh, part of the talk. So uh, I'll then talk about uh, two, a couple of different approaches that people are using for um, uh, all optical image processing uh, with particular um, focus on uh, phase imaging. Uh, this includes using uniform uh, nanoscale thickness um, thin film devices 
and also uh, the nanophotonic uh, meta-optical approaches that uh, we've done a little bit of work on recently. So in order to motivate um, you know, why people are interested in phase contrast imaging, if you think about what camera does, and even our eyes when we are looking at things, essentially we are seeing the intensity of the light on the camera chip. Now, images can be uh, manipulated digitally once those uh, uh, images are obtained. But what that does is it actually discards the phase of the light. And if you think about the way you look at something, um, and in particular, if you look, about, look at, think about light that has passed through some sort of object that you're trying to see, if you want to obtain a conventional image of that object, you need to have some sort of variation in the absorption to generate the contrast that's required for you to be able to actually see it. Now, a lot of objects that are interesting are only very weakly absorbing. But what they do is introduce phase variations into the optical field. And the classic example uh, is um, you know, those of live cells. Now, if you want to see cells, the conventional approach um, is to fix and stain them. But clearly, once that happens, the cells are no longer in their natural state and it precludes investigating cell dynamics, for example. So there's a fairly um, uh, well-established, well, there are a number of very well-established approaches to uh, visualizing transparent uh, objects that have not been stained. Uh, this includes using interferometry, and there are microscopy techniques, including differential interference contrast and Zernike phase contrast methods. Um, and all of these methods um, can successfully visualize phase, but they often involve bulky optics and um, sometimes the optics can also be quite expensive. Now, there are also computational approaches for extracting phase information from an optical field. And uh, the images that you're seeing here, those on the right were obtained using um, solutions to what's called the transport of intensity equation. And that permits the extraction of quantitative phase information. So if you look at these images of cheek cells on the left, this is a conventional bright field image and you can see the you know, very weak uh, variation in contrast that's seen in an unstained cell. But this image showing the phase information shows quite clearly some of the structure within the cell. Now, these methods, they're extremely powerful, but they do actually take uh, time uh, to actually um, extract this particular information. Now, phase contrast imaging, I would say, is a class of image processing, which is a much broader field. And if you think about the, the way images are used in contemporary technology, image processing is very widely used. And typical examples um, of what is actually uh, performed using image processing, it can, it can be used to pull out features such as edges and enhance contrast more generally. Um, it can be used to uh, remove artifacts from images and also to be able to identify and locate objects within an image. The application areas are very diverse. Um, if we think about imaging cells again, it's obvious that there are applications in uh, medicine and uh, the applications are much broader than just imaging cells. Um, remote sensing uh, for agricultural and environmental applications is in another very important area of image processing and machine vision is becoming increasingly important. And in fact, anywhere where spatial information is used is an important um, place where image processing is applied. Now, when one thinks about image processing, and in fact, if you go and look at the dictionary definitions of image processing, they tend to refer to performing um, this using a computer. And there are very efficient algorithms that can be used to manipulate images in various ways. And there are now deep in machine learning approaches that are emerging that are you know, highly successful in, um, you know, modifying Im images and extracting information from them. These, however, can be quite time and energy intensive. 
if you're processing a small amount of data, this isn't a problem. But as if you think about it, the amount of information that is being harvested in the form of images is increasing, you know, rapidly. And also the sorts of applications that need that information tend to be quite demanding in terms of time. So the fact that digital image processing uh, takes time and requires energy is uh, potentially an issue. As I mentioned in my uh, first slide, um, phase is a very important property of an optical field. And if you obtain an image with a camera and attempt to um, uh, manipulate it, you have inherently discarded phase information. Now, before digital image processing um, became available, um, uh, many decades ago, it was uh, first um, uh, demonstrated that uh, light or optical techniques could be used to uh, manipulate an image. And it relies on the Fourier transforming property properties of optical propagation and uh, the prop, uh, passing of light through a lens. And using all optical um, image processing techniques, you can manipulate not only the uh, intensity or the amplitude of an image, but you also can access the phase of the field. And so this is something that cannot be done using uh, conventional computational approaches. Another advantage of all optical methods is that they are real time and do not require any additional energy beyond the input of the uh, image that is being manipulated. Now, as I mentioned in the context of phase imaging, current methods for all optical image processing can be bulky and require expensive components. And uh, this is why digital image processing is so widely used. But with the rise of uh, access to nanophotonics, there is this uh, interesting opportunity to develop ultra compact, all optical real time image processing using chips that can be relatively inexpensive. So I want to say a little bit about what is um, optical image processing because I appreciate that we have a fairly diverse audience uh, watching this. Um, if you think about light um, interacting with some object, so imagine you've got uh, a plane wave incident on some sort of uh, object that um, changes the optical field. So light can be absorbed. There can be uh, variations in phase introduced into the optical field. We can actually decompose the light that's transmitted uh, into a superposition of plane waves that are traveling with different directions with respect to the optical axis of the system. And if you think about the waves that are traveling very close to the optical axis, they actually contain information about the low spatial frequencies in the optical field or the image. So low spatial frequencies correspond to the slowly varying uh, information uh, within the, uh, the image that's been carried. If we look at um, plane waves, or the plane wave components that are traveling at large angles with respect to the optical axis, these correspond to high spatial frequencies. And as the name suggests, this means that we have very fine detail being um, transported by those waves. And in fact, there is a, a correspondence between uh, the spatial frequencies that we refer to as Kx and Ky and the um, angle of propagation of the different plane wave components. Now, if you think about the optical field as being the sum over all of these plane waves, and if you can manipulate uh, selectively some of these waves, that means you actually change the image and hence process the image. And so this lies at the heart of all optical image processing. Now, one way we can access this information is by noting that we can use a lens to uh, Fourier transform an optical field. So if we look at the focal plane of the lens, we've got um, information about an image, we've got the light, the image information traveling, passes through a lens and we go to the focal plane. Um, and if we think about all of these plane wave components, they are all brought to a focus at different points within the focal plane. So we can now spatially address uh, each of those plane wave components by introducing filters. 
So this is a classic example of an all optical image processing system. We have an input image. Um, it then passes through a lens, which um, takes various components contributing to the image to uh, the, uh, the focal plane, frequency plane, um, the spatial frequency plane. There are different ways of describing it. And one can introduce filters there that will change the amplitude and or phase of the different components. And uh, then the information exiting the system has been altered in some way. And by you know, blocking out information on the axis here, we lose the low spatial frequency information and we just retain the edges. Now, if we go back to phase contrast, using a system like this lies at the heart of Zernike phase contrast. In that case, there is a, uh, a filter that manipulates the relative um, phases of the various plane wave components. And um, this um, uh, is an image from a, a paper published in 1955 where Cernicke was uh, talking about the research that um, led to him being awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. And in fact, I think these images were uh, over 20 years old and what they are, they describe um, diatoms, and you can see the bright field image has relatively weak uh, contrast, but by using um, this special filtering technique, um, the contrast of the object, or the image of the object is significantly enhanced. Now, obviously, if you look at a system like this, it includes lenses, it includes propagation distances. So there is a question as to whether we can create more compact systems um, using uh, much smaller optical components. And this leads to consideration of nanophotonics and uh, more specifically, uh, what I'll refer to as metasurfaces, which are a type of flat optical component. Now, a metasurface consists of a two-dimensional arrangement of nanoparticles. Um, these nanoparticles are very thin, and that means the overall structure is compatible with conventional planar fabrication approaches. Now, the way these devices behave depend on the physical properties of the, of the particles, the metasurface, that is their, uh, their geometry and the materials out of which they are composed and that surround them. Um, they also depend on the nature of the illumination. So they depend on the polarization in general and also can depend on the angle of incidence. So if you think about this relationship between spatial frequency and angle of incidence that I mentioned before, we can actually design meta optics that have a sensitivity to spatial frequency. And I'll come back to that. So a lot of research in meta optics involves um, exploring ways we can utilize light matter interactions on the nanoscale to create ultra compact alternatives to conventional devices. And that's what's been shown here in these images where these are various realizations of meta optical lenses. Um, they have thicknesses of the order of 100 nanometers or so, and they replace a lens that is uh, much thicker and heavier. Typically, lenses have thicknesses that are measured in millimeters or a centimeter or so. Now, further to um, trying to replace conventional optics with much more compact devices, the way we can manipulate light with meta optics opens up potential new functionality. Uh, and in particular, uh, that's relevant to what I'm talking about, um, methods for image processing and enhancing contrast. So there's actually two ways in which uh, meta optics can um, play a role in all optical information processing. Firstly, if we take our conventional um, all optical image processing, um, platform that I mentioned before, we can actually um, utilize the point-to-point -point flexibility in meta optics in generating um, to generate an arbitrary coherent spatial filter. And this relies on the fact that we can independently control the amplitude and phase at different points uh, within the Fourier plane. And this is actually a challenge or was a challenge with um, uh, the, the initial um, use of all optical spatial filtering. So we can use meta optics to create, you know, better spatial filters. The other area, and this is the one we've been um, looking at, is to utilize uh, some non-local 
um, uh, properties of meta optics to um, generate what's called object or image plane um, spatial frequency filter. It's sometimes referred to as a Green's function approach. And what we do is we directly manipulate the spatial frequency content of a transmitted or reflected wave. And what that means is effectively we need an angle sensitive device. And there are a number of uh, different ways that could, this can be realized using nanophotonics. So in terms of meta surface based spatial filters, there's been some uh, interesting demonstrations. Uh, the, the, um, the one shown here involves using a metal insulator metal system where the geometry of the um, block on top um, is um, modified spatially. And this was used to gem generate reflective spatial filters that um, were utilized to demonstrate both um, integration and differentiation of reflected optical signals. Another method uh, involves um, utilizing the Pancharatnam berry phase and um, projecting light onto a device. It's uh, a phase device that um, was um, fabricated using uh, femtosecond laser processing. And by uh, placing uh, an image between cross polarizers, uh, it's possible to demonstrate broadband edge enhancement of images. So the other approach um, that, as I said, we've been exploring is to directly um, access uh, the, or directly modify the Fourier components of a transmitted or reflected optical field. So um, what, what that involves is um, getting rid of all of this where you need um, propagation distances and lenses and things like this, which can take, you know, centimetres uh, typically and replacing all of that with a single meta optic um, that is, you know, orders of magnitude um, thinner. And if you can do this, there's uh, some uh, interesting application applications. One that we've explored is a patterning cover slip that can be used in a microscope uh, that uh, it, uh, directly permits phase contrast. And I'll show an example of that later on. Uh, meta optics could be incorporated directly onto a camera chip. Uh, or um, because we're talking about devices that have an inherent angular sensitivity, they could also be integrated into a non-imaging um, sensor to create a angle sensitive detector. So this is um, a schematic showing what we're trying to achieve. If you have a uh, light incident on a structure um, and uh, Depending on the angle of incidence, the uh, transmission will vary. And uh, if you can do that, you can actually use this to manipulate images in various ways. Um, the applications include, as I mentioned, uh, phase imaging of transparent objects such as cells, but it could also be extended to wavefront recovery and uh, provide an adjunct to computational imaging approaches. Now, if we want to use this um, approach, uh, when we think about what the meta optic does to an incident optical field, we now need to think about uh, what is happening in Fourier space. So we describe the behavior of the, um, the device in terms of an optical transfer function, or indeed a tensor, because a lot of our devices are polarization sensitive. And that tensor multiplies the Fourier transform of the input optical field. And that produces the Fourier transform of the output optical field. And, um, and because that has changed, that means that the um, output field when considered in the spatial domain has also changed. Now, this approach to information processing um, or image processing um, has been known about for some time. And there was interest in this in the late 1970s and 80s. And uh, the first example that I could find was um, the use of volume hologram filters that were used to um, demonstrate uh, edge detection of um, amplitude um, images. Uh, Stephen Case, who did this work, actually pointed out a very uh, interesting um, side benefit of this particular approach to image processing. And that is 
that um, it is relatively insensitive to the lo to the location of the device. When you're performing uh, conventional image processing, optical image processing, the device has to sit in the um, the focal plane of the lens. Uh, in this case, that isn't required. You can actually um, uh, place the device um, in other positions. Uh, there are some caveats on that, but um, but it, but you have a lot more flexibility than you do with a conventional image processing system. Another example involved using uh, uh, interference detuned interference filters, and using this it was shown that uh, an edge enhanced image could be produced. And there have also been demonstrations involving photonic crystals and other devices. But what we find now is that the um, availability of um, uh, nanophotonic devices that you know were not foreseen at the time that these were originally envisaged um, opens up uh, you know, new opportunities and new methods to control and manipulate images of various kinds. I should point out that my uh, theory about why uh, this um, didn't become more widely used was that it coincided with the rise of uh, co computation and the fact that um, this kind of image processing could be uh, performed much more simply using a computer. So let's have a look at some methods for this that, for performing this object plane filtering. Uh, firstly, I'll say a little bit about some thin film approaches. And if you think about um, the excitation of surface plasmon polaritons on, on a metallic film, um, that has a high sensitivity to angle of incidence. And this is for, I forget the thickness um, of a layer of, um, of a thin layer of gold, um, shows the reflectance as a function of angle of incidence for um, both P and S polarization. And you can see that for P polarization, there is this strong angular sensitivity about this particular value. And it's this kind of um, behavior that can be utilized in uh, object plane Fourier filtering. And in fact, it can be shown that the transfer function is uh, directly proportional to the spatial frequency. So um, uh, one can say that the uh, incident field is being differentiated. Okay, so if you've got an incident Gaussian beam, the output field would look like its derivative. Of course, if you um, take images of the input field, it would look like this. Um, the output field looks like this, but once you obtain an image of it with a camera, you lose um, uh, the ability to discriminate between um, positive and negative values, and you just see something that looks like this. Um, this, in this work, it was shown that um, uh, uh, illuminating this structure with various images, both amplitude and phase, led to edge enhancement. So this is an example of um, uh, enhancing uh, or utilising phase contrast using this particular approach. Um, interestingly, um, there's been some uh, work looking at just reflection of light from a dielectric surface. Uh, with appropriate choice of polarizers. Again, differentiation can be performed and uh, enhancement of uh, edges of amplitude objects was, was, um, was demonstrated in this particular case. Uh, in my group, we looked at the reflection of light from a uh, metal insulator metal. This is just a planar thin film structure. And again, at a, uh, the resonant wavelength, we could see that the edges of the image were enhanced. Once you went away from uh, resonance, we no longer saw this particular uh, behavior. And there's been some other uh, interesting proposals for uh, slab-based devices, including one involving a waveguiding layer that can be used to perform integration of an incident optical field, and also using a uh, Bragg device to um, uh, demonstrate or to potentially, um, uh, well, this is a proposal, but um, they showed computationally that the derivative of the incident uh, field uh, resulted on uh, reflection at an appropriate angle of incidence. Now, um, 
We've done a little bit of work on this recently because um, if we think about thin film devices, there are a range of systems that exhibit this angular sensitivity. So um, based on a, a, just a, a suggestion from my collaborator, Tim Davis, we uh, looked at uh, what, what we could do with just a commercial spectral notch filter. So this is a device. If we look at the, we bought it from Thor Labs. If we measure the transmission as a function of wavelength and uh, angle of incidence, uh, we can clearly see we have this band where there's nothing transmitted, but it is um, dependent on angle of incidence. If we look at a particular wavelength, you can see that there are some angles, spatial frequencies, that are transmitted um, quite strongly, whereas there are others, the low spatial frequencies, that are blocked. And so we could actually demonstrate uh, edge enhancement using this device because we've uh, blocked our low spatial frequencies. And in terms of phase contrast, we we're able to significantly enhance the uh, visibility of uh, HeLa cells, um, and these are uns unstained HeLa cells. In the absence of the device, we um, uh, the contrast is uh, uh, quite poor, but as, uh, as soon as we introduce the device, note that it has to be um, tilted around this angle here, we could generate some pseudo uh, 3D phase contrast of this device. So this was just some uh, work that we undertook recently, um, at basically to inform some uh, future uh, steps in our meta-optical work. Now, in terms of meta-optics, um, there's been a lot of uh, work in this uh, uh, field over the last few years. Um, some relatively early work was done by uh, my collaborators, um, Tim Davis and Daniel Gomez, who looked at this device here. They refer to it as a Wheatstone bridge structure. And what it consists is of is an array of these uh, dolmen type features where you've got uh, two parallel rods and another rod sitting between them that's at 90 degrees to the two rods. And what they um, demonstrated was that if there's any imbalance in the excitation of uh, these two rods due to, for example, the phase difference associated with off normal incidence, that leads to coupling into this um, other rod. And so that if you actually have light illuminating the structure that's polarized parallel to these two rods here and have an analyzer that is in the orthogonal direction, then the transmission through this system is going to depend on the angle of incidence. And here is the uh, magnitude of the optical transfer function. Uh, it's plotted here as a function of spatial frequency. So zero spatial frequency is normal incidence. Uh, the dots here show experimental results and the blue curve is the, um, uh, the transfer function calculated using a, a, a approximate electrostatic model. So it's clear that this um, uh, structure has an angle dependence. And in fact, it can be shown that the um, angular sensitivity for small values of Kx is approximately linear in Kx. So in fact, it can potentially um, differentiate an input uh, optical field. Another example um, is a grating, and I'll, I'll actually be talking about both of these systems a little bit more later on. But in this case, uh, you have grating. Uh, if you have an incident optical field, uh, they are able to show that the output was the derivative of the input. And, uh, and in terms of image processing, this led to enhancement of edges. To give you a little bit more insight into what's happening here, I just wanted to talk about the results of some calculations using a, I call it a toy model, but it's based on a, a, a rigorous electromagnetic, rigorous electromagnetic model um, that can calculate the transmission of electromagnetic waves through coaxial mm. apertures in a perfectly electrically conducting film. So we have an incident uh, plane wave, and if we calculate the transmission as a function of angle of incidence, uh, the vertical axis here is the uh, wavelength normalized the period of the structure, and the horizontal axis is the uh, angle of incidence. And we've got the two polarizations here. And you can see that for both polarizations, there is a 
resonance occurring here where you get maximum transmission, it's fairly insensitive to angle of incidence and it corresponds to a, a dipole mode of, of, the, uh, of the cavities themselves. But we do note that there is, uh, for TM polarisation, uh, a resonance that is sensitive to angle of incidence. And that's because of symmetry. It is the transverse electromagnetic mode that cannot be excited with a normally incident plane wave. Uh, if we have a look at the transmission as a function of uh, spatial frequency, so this is a function of angle base, basically, the black dot in the middle corresponds to normal incidence, so zero spatial frequency. And we can clearly see that for small values of Kx and Ky, Again, we've got this increasing um, uh, transmission. So this is behaving like a high pass filter as well. So utilizing this one-to-one -one correspondence between the angle of incidence and spatial frequency, this is a classic example, at least theoretically, of a system that has this dependence on spatial frequency. And because we can decompose an arbitrary optical field into this superposition of plane waves, Passing the light through a device like this changes the angular spectrum and hence modifies or processes the um, transmitted field. We can see how this behaves again, theoretically, I should point out that uh, a device like this would be very difficult to fabricate. Um, again, if we assume that we've uh, picked out a wavelength corresponding to this mode, pass an image through it, uh, these are simulations showing that we would expect an edge-enhanced image. Mm. Furthermore, because of the polarisation sensitivity of the excitation of the relevant mode, uh, we can tune the image by changing the polarisation. Now, in terms of um, phase imaging, uh, we need to think a little bit more about the uh, response of our system um, or the, 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 the symmetric or asymmetric response of our system. Now, if we want to, for example, uh, perform differentiation of an optical image, uh, as I mentioned before, this corresponds to a transfer function that's proportional to Kx um, and or Ky if you're differentiating in the, um, in the y direction. But note that Kx takes positive and negative values. And this means that even if you have a device that has a transfer function that looks like this, as soon as you obtain an image with a camera, you lose information. In fact, you lose the ability to discriminate between positive and negative values of Kx, or equivalently, um, the ability to discriminate between where the field is increasing or decreasing. As an example, uh, these are some images I showed you before. This is uh, maybe an input Gaussian, if it is um, passes through a system that has this linear transfer function, the field would look like this. But when you go and take the intensity, the, because you've got negative values here and positive values here, as soon as you go and take the intensity, you'd end up with something like this. So you wouldn't be able to discern which was positive and which was negative. One way to get around this is by uh, introducing some asymmetry into uh, your system. This can be done through uh, design uh, of the device itself. Uh, it can be done by utilising off-normal incidence because that introduces a, a phase bias. And it can also be uh, uh, achieved using polarisation techniques. And the application that uh, we've been focused on is phase imaging. And what um, this um, introducing an asymmetry does is it enables us to resolve positive and negative phase gradients and also to produce a pseudo three-dimensional uh, phase contrast uh, image, uh, which is actually much more uh, easy to interpret than uh, an image that um, you know, doesn't have that particular property. So I'll give you some um, theoretical examples before I move on to some of our experimental results. If we go back to this um, sort of hypothetical system that we're looking at, and imagine that you're illuminating with an image that has no intensity variation, so there's no absorption, um, there's no, no variation in amplitude, but there is some variation in phase that looks like that. Again, we're assuming this particular excitation of this mode that's transporting energy through the device. Uh, 
we would expect our output image to look like this. Uh, we can clearly see edges. Um, uh, so we we can visualize the edges of the um, of the the phase distribution. However, if we tilt the device slightly, uh, that introduces this asymmetry, and uh, you can clearly see you've got a much more uh, nuanced uh, image of your device. Um, to give you another example, um, if we go back to the Wheatstone bridge structure, but now we um, let the output polarizer, the analyzer, um, transmit uh, light with the electric field that's parallel to those uh, vertical uh, rods there. And uh, the input polarizer is at some uh, angle to um, these rods. And in particular, if we think about what we would see, or if we measure what we see when the input polarizer is at 45 degrees to the output polarizer. Um, and um, these data are actually obtained by uh, my collaborator, Tim Davis. Um, and these are three different angles of incidence. The blue curve is normal incidence. Uh, the green curve is at some off normal angle of incidence. And the maroon curve, is the same angle of incidence, but on the other side of the normal. And what you can see here is that for the green curve and the maroon curve are not the same. And so clearly uh, this is a system that exhibits some asymmetry. If we pick out this uh, resonant wavelength here, which is 680 nanometers or so, and, and plot um, the, the uh, black dots are experimental data, uh, the red curves are the results of the um, simple electrostatic model. Uh, you can clearly see if we plot the intensity, transmitted intensity is a function of spatial frequency extending from negative to positive values. You can clearly see now we have this asymmetry. If we um, rotate the uh, input polarizer by 90 degrees, we still have an asymmetry, but we've reversed the contrast. If we have orthogonal polarizers, we have the situation that we looked at before. Uh, but the, the variation with spatial frequency um, isn't showing up on this particular scale here. If we have parallel polarizers, the, um, the variation there isn't very interesting. Now, we're still um, investigating this system to, to obtain images experimentally, but we've considered what we would expect um, in terms of simulation if we uh, projected a phase distribution that corresponds to a a mock red blood cell onto a device like this that has this particular uh, behavior. If we have the orthogonal polarizers, we can clearly see uh, the edges appearing uh, within our image, so we can get edge enhancement. Uh, however, uh, we can get uh, much more useful information if we have this asymmetric transfer function. So I think this motivates the uh, benefit of introducing that asymmetry. Uh, furthermore, uh, we, you can see that by rotating the input polarizer by 90 degrees, we've actually reversed the contrast. So as I said, we're still working on this. So I just want to spend the last part of my talk discussing some um, uh, systems where we've actually obtained some experimental uh, results. The first of these involves uh, resonant waveguide gratings, both 1D and 2D. So we have uh, a wave guiding layer sitting on a substrate. So our layer was um, type, uh, TiO2 and mm. uh, the metallic nanostructures, which were either rods or patches, uh, they were silver. And a system like this is well known to have a strong sensitivity to angle of incidence. So Lucas Vaserman, who led this work, um, made a variety of structures here. And on the left here, you can see the experimentally obtained um, uh, transfer functions, essentially, where um, you can see that at the various resonant wavelengths, at low spatial frequencies, you can see that the transmission is suppressed. But as the um, spatial frequencies increase, you can see that the uh, transmission increases. Uh, if we go off resonance, and there's some uh, selected values here, you can clearly see that this uh, property disappears. So it's uh, quite a, um, it, it, it um, is not a broadband effect. In the case of the gratings, the uh, uh, incident electric field is polarized, so it's parallel to the, to the bars themselves. 
Now, if we look at this particular device and project onto it a, a phase image, and the phase image was generated using a spatial light modulator. And um, so this is the basic idea here. We have an image being projected onto this device and we put a camera behind it to uh, obtain the transmitted image. If the device is, um, uh, or the, the uh, illumination is normally incident on the device, uh, we can um, clearly see that we've got, um, we're, we're seeing the edges of our phase image here. In the absence of the device, there is uh, negligible contrast. If we tilt the device, however, this actually introduces that um, asymmetry. And you can clearly see this uh, pseudo 3D uh, contrast appearing. And uh, this is, I think, uh, captured quite well in this uh, animation here that just shows what happens when you uh, move the patterned area of the device in and out of the beam. So in the absence of the device, there's no contrast or negligible contrast, but moving the, um, uh, the, 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 what, the device into the beam, we can clearly see the phase uh, variations. We applied this to imaging biological samples. These are unstained HeLa cells. And um, this is a differential interference contrast um, microscopy image of, of the cells. And um, these are images obtained using in a bright field microscope. Uh, these are, are um, cells that are not on the patterned area of the device. And you can clearly see that the contrast is extremely poor but we get this very uh, information rich pseudo 3D contrast image um, from, from our device when um, the cells are sitting on the, uh, on the grating itself. Down here, we've got the um, images that we've obtained compared with DIC and also fluorescence. And it, we do have some evidence that we're able to see some uh, fine features within the cells themselves. Um, this is uh, another movie. I think um, I quite like this because, again, it just highlights um, just how different the images appear um, when the cells are sitting on, uh, on the patterned area of the device compared to those that are just sitting on, on the glass part of the cover slip itself. So this is what we see off the device. And what you'll see is that um, the patterned area of the sample is moved into the field of view and you can uh, instantly um, see an enhanced contrast image. So there were cells in that lower region, um, but um, you, you just uh, couldn't see them. And I think this also highlights the fact that it is real time and uh, there's been no uh, processing performed on the, um, on the images um, after, uh, after they were obtained. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, one other example of um, exploiting a, an asymmetric optical system. Now, there is a technique uh, called optical or photonic routing that's attracted uh, an enormous amount of interest uh, over the past decade or so. Um, there was a, a very interesting experiment performed um, uh, in uh, Federico Capasso's group, it was uh, the lead author was Zhao Lin. And what they looked at was a metallic film that was patterned with um, uh, holes, these um, rectangular slots. And what they saw was that if this device was um, excited with, um, it was illuminated with circularly polarized light, the uh, direction of the uh, surface plasma polaritons on the metallic film uh, was dictated by the helicity of the incident optical field. Um, more recently, in some uh, theoretical work where they were demonstrating a, a new Fourier modal method, um, it was shown that uh, a device, and it was inspired by um, this uh, earlier work, which consists of um, uh, nano rods that are at 90 degrees to each other and they're spatially offset from each other. Um, they are sitting on a wave guiding layer. Now, if they are illuminated with circularly polarized light, um, because the rods are at 90 degrees to each other, they are excited 
out of phase with each other. And because they are also separated from each other by a, a fixed amount, the, um, the light coupled into the waveguide is going to depend on the helicity of the incident circular polarised light. And with their um, uh, numerical method, they are able to show that um, if we look at the uh, reflection, the transmission and the absorption by this system for um, right, that's the top row, and left circular polarised light as a function of uh, the vertical axis here is photon energy and the horizontal axis is Kx. These vertical lines here represent normal incidence. You can clearly see in all of these plots that there is um, an asymmetry in these various quantities about normal incidence. So this is clearly another platform that exhibits this asymmetry. So we thought we'd investigate this from the point of view of image processing. And this is the uh, parameters of the device that uh, Lucas Vaseman fabricated. Here we have a uh, the transmittance calculated using the finite element method. Um, if we look at the feature marked two here, this um, dip, and look at the um, Z component of the electric field, this is the, um, the component of the electric field perpendicular to the plane of the device. Um, for right circular polarized light, uh, you can see that um, uh, light is uh, propagating to the left within the wave guiding uh, layer in this particular case. If we um, look at uh, the surface charge on the metallic nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles, you can see that they are excited out of phase with each other. And if we change the illumination to left circular polarized light, you can see that the um, direction of propagation of the optical fields in the waveguide has reversed. So this is the just highlighting this uh, optical routing effect in this particular platform. Um, this is a scanning electron microscope image of the fabricated device. Here we have the um, square root of the uh, uh, transmission uh, for both uh, for as a function of um, spatial frequency, and this is at that uh, resonant wavelength. And we look at it for uh, right and left circular polarized light, and you can see that um, we have this asymmetry and the contrast is reversed if we change the helicity of the incident light. So these are uh, these data points here are the experimentally obtained values. Um, the, uh, we tested the uh, image processing capability of this particular device by projecting an image, a phase image generated using a spatial light modulator onto the device. In the absence of the metasurface, um, there are some uh, artifacts here that are providing some contrast. However, including the metasurface significantly enhance the contrast. And furthermore, we can uh, reverse that contrast by um, changing the helicity of the incident light. And again, this is this pseudo 3D phase contrast that uh, provides this you know, powerful visualization of, of phase. So there are some significant uh, opportunities, but also some challenges uh, going forward in uh, utilizing meta optics for image processing. Uh, there's a, um, you know, a lot of uh, work being done on improving the efficiency. Uh, there are some questions there about whether one wants to uh, have a narrow band or broadband illumination. Uh, there are an enormous range of different um, systems that exhibit this uh, angular sensitivity or spatial frequency sensitivity, and uh, some of these do require uh, a fairly uh, narrow band illumination. Another area of uh, interest is the role that coherence plays. All of the systems I've described have assumed um, coherence, uh, but a lot of image imaging utilizes partially coherent or incoherent illumination. Uh, improving the contrast of systems is uh, another interesting challenge. Uh, if you had a close look at the uh, uh, some of the data on the previous slide, you'll notice that the numerical aperture of that system was quite low. So expanding the numerical aperture of the performance of the system um, is, is something that uh, we're trying to do. 
Um, in addition to, in terms of opportunities, um, I think um, there are some uh, looking at uh, coherence effects. There's a lot of uh, very interesting work going on at the moment in terms of thinking about how these non-local effects can actually be combined with the uh, local effects that are seen a lot of meta optics to create uh, much more powerful devices. Um, another significant area of opportunity is integrating uh, these devices into detectors, for example, and uh, other optical systems. And as is the case with a lot of meta optics, being able to uh, tune devices so you could, for example, um, uh, dynamically change the contrast is something that is also potentially quite interesting. Finally, um, I focused on all optical approaches, but there are potentially uh, opportunities in hybrid approaches where the optics is used to uh, extract certain information and computers could be used to, um, to you know, extract even more information from the resulting um, data that's obtained. So uh, that brings me to the end. So essentially, um, you know, my group and other groups have been able to demonstrate object plane filtering using uh, meta optics and in fact, thin film approaches. We've looked at fairly simple systems. And in fact, um, if one starts to look at more complex um, meta optics, one can imagine that uh, there are a wealth of other possibilities that can be, um, can be utilized. And these will give us even more control over transfer functions. And also um, the visualization of phase is actually an important application. It's one that um, uh, digital approaches struggle with. So what we've got here are ultra compact approaches to um, all optical real-time image processing. Um, these devices are potentially uh, very lightweight and compact and uh, could be uh, mass produced. Um, the net consequence of this is that um, the amount of materials used in their fabrication is quite small and the uh, power requirements are significantly re reduced compared to digital approaches. So I've just listed a few potential applications here, but um, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, image processing touches on so many different areas of spatial information management that the application space is um, potentially enormous. So before I finish, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone in my group who's contributed to this work, in particular, Dr. Lucas Bazerman, uh, when he was a PhD student and now as a research fellow has made uh, significant contributions to um, uh, the last couple of um, projects that I talked about. I'd also like to acknowledge the financial support of um, the University of Melbourne and the Australian Research Council and the provision of facilities by the Melbourne Centre for Nanofabrication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for a great talk. It's highly informative and also fascinating. Um, so now I would like to um, start to really introduce our panelists tonight. So Anne, if you could just stop sharing your screen, uh, I'll bring my screen on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, so let me first introduce our panelists tonight. First is, my, um, is Michael Scholes. So Professor Michael Scholes is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at Virginia Tech. He received his PhD in 2014 in organic and polymer chemistry and a master's degree in pharmaceutical science at the University of Florida under the supervision of Professor Ken Wagner. After conducting research at Max Planck Institute of Full Polymer Research as a Fulbright Scholar in the group of Professor Klaus Mullen, he was a postdoc scholar in the group of Professor Robert Grubbs at Caltech. Uh, Michael began his independent research career at Virginia Tech in 2017. His diverse research interests span both fundamental and applied polymer chemistry, including an antiviral polymers, metal collating materials, and polymer sequestrants. Our next panelist is uh, Professor Jian Dongye from Nanjing University. 
Jian Dong holds the full professorship at the School of Electronics in Science Engineering, Nanjing University. He received his bachelor's and a PhD degree at Nanjing University in 2016 and 2000, sorry, in 2002 and 2006. And during 2006 to 2015, he, he served as a senior research engineer in Institute for Microelectronics, ASTAR in Singapore, and, and ARC and Australia Research Council, Queen Elizabeth II Fellow at the Australian National University. In 2013, uh, Jian Dong was awarded by the National Excellence Youth Fund of China, an outstanding youth fund of Jiangsu province. He was funded by National Key R&D Project of China, National Natural Science Foundation of China. Currently, Jian Dong focuses on the research of ultra-wide band gap oxide semiconductor materials and devices. Our ex challenger tonight is um, Dr. Jin Yong Ma from the Australian National University. Dr. Jin Yong Ma is a research fellow from Professor and Andre Sukhov Rokov's group at Australian U National University and a research program manager at the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Transformative Metal Optical Systems. He's working on the generation and the detection of entangled photon pairs from nonlinear matter surfaces. Dr. Ma received his bachelor's and master's degree in Professor Ng Wu's group at Huazhong University of Science and Technology. He completed his PhD in Professor Ping Kwai Lam's group at the Australian National University in 2020, and then joined Professor Jack Harris at the Yale University as a postdoc associate until 2021, working in the field of quantum optomechanics and optical navigation. So let me in, invite all our panelists tonight to the stage for the panel discussion. Okay, so let's, as always, let's start with um, our ex-challenger. So Dr. Ma, do you have any question to Professor Ann Roberts, please? Hi, Len, thanks very much. And and yeah, thank you very much for the fantastic talk. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, so the first one is like, um, to have shown the presence of the matter surface, such as matter gradients, can significantly improve the Im imaging co contrast. So there are many, um, there are many advantages. There are like more control or ultra, uh, ultra compact. Then, uh, so for the current stage, how does it compare? How does the, how does the performance compare the ways um, approaches enabled by bo a bulky crystal? or not, not filters you have mentioned. And also you have um, presented some challenges such as efficiency and bandwidth. And how far is it, uh, is it the matter service approach away from the commercialization? Okay, so the mm -hmm. interesting question. So uh, they're really about, um, so the question's about, first one's about performance. And I guess you're asking about the, you know, we just got that notch filter and tried that out. Um, so the, and I didn't mention at the time, so the notch filter does work, but we did have to tilt it quite a lot to get it to work. And, um, and in fact, there are uh, aberrations. Um, I mean, I didn't compare them, but the quality images that we obtained with the thinner meta optical devices is superior to these filters. So the filters, you know, quite thick. And, um, but the thing is, uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do that is we really wanted to explore, you know, you know, just make sure that, you know, if we just got an off the shelf system, what, what, are, what are the issues that we face there and how could they be addressed? And there are, I think, um, the, with that approach, you'd probably want to go back and redesign the thing from scratch for this particular application. And, um, and, there, and, you know, there are some of the, I mentioned some of the thin film type of approaches that people have got, um, have proposed. Um, and, uh, you know, so some of them have, you know, those designs are tailored for specific applications. But I think they're actually quite challenging to fabricate to get that precision thin film performance with the, um, the geometry and optical properties, you know, perfect. Um, although it is, you know, it is a fairly mature technology. So I think it could, that that is a potentially interesting path. What it doesn't do, however, is, um, and, and again, I didn't emphasize this, but um, we did, as I said, we had to tilt it. 
and not having to tilt the device is something I think we're we're exploring because I think actually having to mechanically tilt the device even by a few degrees does actually affect the the optical system to some extent. So the the um, the the Wheatstone Bridge approach with the pole tuning the polarizers we quite like that because we don't have to tilt it. And also the last one on the uh, photonic routing that also doesn't require any tilting. So um, you know that that's quite um, you know we we quite like those. So that's in terms of comparison. As I said, there's a lot of people working in this space at the moment, and so some people have uh, demonstrated devices that have actually very high efficiencies, and also some others that have uh, uh, relatively high numerical aperture as well. Um, uh, but they haven't. Uh, I, I think we are the first people looking at that. You know, the asymmetry. Um, we're looking at trying to optimize it because. Um, yeah, I think at the moment our numerical aperture, the range is too limited to really um, push it into the commercialization space. But, you know, I, I, I have a feeling with this that if we can get things, um, imp improve some of the performance using some of the strategies we're currently exploring, I think it could, you know, once, once we've got things in place, it could be um, commercialized fairly quickly because the you know, the fabrication's fairly mature. Once we've got the designs right, the demonstrations, I think it, it could be it could be fairly uh, fairly rapid. But okay. yeah, there's, there's there's still steps to, <laughs> to get yeah, through to yeah, get yeah. to that point. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. And thank you and for then, the question. Yeah. So yeah. my second question is a little bit technical. So so to achieve the face uh, face contrast imaging, so uh, you mentioned the angular dependent resonance is needed. So how does the uh, imaging quality depend on the quality factor of the resonance? Or actually, or a, uh, a, a, relative, a related question is, uh, as you have mentioned just now, the tilting angle um, may be an issue mm -hmm. or problem. Also, how does the sensitivity of the angular dependence influence the imaging quality? Okay, so you're thinking about the angular sensitivity. Okay, yes. So, so yeah. the um, with the, okay, that's sort of several things in there. <laughs> So let's <laughs> talk about the, uh, the the quality factor. The quality factor has um, so some of the, some of the uh, uh, designs that people have put forward and um, in fact demonstrated, you know, where they just reflect light off a a dielectric boundary. Um, that's broadband, okay? So that's you know that it's it's a non -re it's not a resonant effect. Uh, mm. It's sort of a yeah, so and so so there's that sort of thing, and then there are some some of these you know uh, bound modes in the continuum type approaches are relatively um, high Q. Now that actually presents some problems in terms of uh, it's it's very narrow band performance, and if it's too narrow band, then you know it just becomes impractical. So there's this balance between um, you know performance and mm -hmm. you know practicality and 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 performance now if you had you know your laser perfectly matched to the cue of your device and everything that would be that that would, everything would be fine but it's actually as i said it's quite a broad space at the moment and there's there's a, people are trying a lot of different things now back to your question about the angle uh this is where the numerical aperture becomes an issue so the that the last device we talked about actually only has, has a device of less than point, uh, NA of point 0.1. So really what that means is it actually constrains the types of um, objects or images that we can actually um, process because um, if the objects are too small, they contain uh, spatial frequency information that's beyond the capacity of the device to manipulate. So that's that's the consequence of that. It actually uh, impacts what actual op fields we can actually manipulate. So that's that's why we're keen to um, expand the NA and and you know other other groups as well, and some of whom have, have come up with designs that 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 that, that do that. But I don't think they have the asymmetry. Mm. Mm. Okay. Good questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. Okay.
Thanks, Jiyong. So now we we move to Michael. Do you have any questions? Yes. So uh, first of all, that was a really fascinating talk. I, I learned a lot. So thank you for that. Uh, I have a number of questions on the metasurfaces themselves, and I'll try to combine this into one multi-part question. Um, I'm wondering what are the major approaches to fabricating these surfaces and what length scale of the features are accessible by the different approaches and are all desirable uh, feature sizes accessible with current approaches or is this an opportunity for more development uh, in this area? Okay, so that, that's a very good question because I didn't talk about fabrication at all. I just <laughs> put it up there. So um, all of the devices that we have fabricated uh, were fabricated using electron bank lithography. And um, we haven't tried to, you know, so, so we've incorporated those constraints into our design. So um, we haven't really looked at, you know, what would happen if we could improve the resolution? Because I think, you know, we do have an eye on practicality and mass production. And um, so we really don't want to push that any further um, down. Uh, uh, that being said, I, uh, I've, I've had some work over the last few years where we've used nano in print lithography. So uh, one of the things I'd like to do would be to able to get to a point where we can uh, print out some of these. Um, devices and um, yeah so that would be yeah that would be where we'd like to go with this so but you know there's other you know and we could fabricate devices using focused iron beam milling too if we wanted to have a more whole based device rather than a particle uh, based system or yeah yeah yeah. What's the smallest feature size you can get with those techniques? Oh, okay, so our those rods on that last image, they were about um, 30, 40 nanometers by 80 nanometers or something like that. So we're talking 10, 10 nanometer sort of resolution, 10, 20 nanometer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then I have kind of a, a broader question uh, also. You identified some of the challenges and opportunities of the field going forward. And I'd kind of like to hear your perspective on which of those challenges do you think are gonna be more or less solved in the next 10 years and which ones are going to be kind of the enduring challenges uh, of the field going forward? <laughs> okay, well, the really exciting opportunities. For, I think, you know, um, I think, integration into other devices is going to keep people busy for a while. Um, I think, um, look, I think a lot of those, uh, there's a lot of people working on this at the moment. And in fact, the this whole idea of um, incorporating uh, local and non-local, um, and by that, I mean, rather than having a meta a device, where it, which is effectively kind of, the same everywhere. All the particles are basically the same size and orientation um, where they actually start varying the geometry across the device. That opens up a whole new degree of freedom. Um, and uh, that that I think um, might have some uh, interesting, interesting spin-offs in the field. Um, yeah, as I said, you know, we I think, you know, at the moment we've just looking at the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot more scope for doing more things. So I think some of the, some I think there'll be designs for devices that have really, um, really uh, good performance appearing, you know, in the not too distant future. And then the challenge will be realising them and, you know, make sure that they have the, you know, a, a, a bandwidth that matches the potential applications I think, um, yeah, I think I think the ten year time frame is relatively long in this in this field. So I think I think a lot there'll be a lot of uh, progress over that period. Well, thank you. R really fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, before moving to Jeno, I might just have a follow up question from Michael's one when he talk about the you know the 
the, the, the feature size and, and the scaling up issues, I think, um, what is really the limited factor to the design of the structure to the small feature? Is the, the optical setup that you use or is, or is actually a particular application you have to do like in terms of the imaging object? Um, what, what is really push like the design to a small feature size? Oh, okay. So uh, we, uh, we're we trying to avoid um, diffraction, you know, because if you've got, I mean, you can create diffractive structures that still have useful properties. And I think some of this non, non-local kind of work that people are doing, that's what they'll be exploiting. Um, but we also want to have optical, a lot of our structures are relying on optical resonances of the particles. Yeah. So that really determines the size um, to a large degree. Um, there are people working on non-resonant types of devices where that is less of an issue. But again, they don't, you, you need to have, you know, the geometry needs to be such that it's not going to, to you know, affect the image in other ways, if you know what I mean. If, if, the, if the structures are too big, then they'll become a, um, evident in the resulting images. There was an example from another group that I showed earlier on where they looked at uh, femtosecond laser writing of a device. It was a uh, like a spatial filter type of device. And um, so I think the scale size of that is larger than the sorts of things that we've done, but they were able to still, you know, depending on that, again, it depends on what size object you're looking at and what you're trying to do. You know, what, what's the application you want? Are you going to, are you going to be putting your device on a cover slip to look at microscopic objects? Or do you want to put it on a camera chip to, to process images at that point? And, you know, we're talking about different scale sizes there. So, yeah. So, you know, it's going to be, I think it's going to be horses for courses. Yeah. Great. So, Thank you. Yeah. Jen. Yeah. Yeah. Jendo, sorry, it's your turn now. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you, Anne, for your uh, wonderful talk. Actually, frankly speaking, I'm not in work on the nanophotonics, and I, I have tried to ask my uh, friends to prepare two, uh, two questions for me. But actually now, I changed my mind because um, I learned, thought, a lot, learned a lot from your talk and uh, have my own questions. So the first one is actually for the, I know for the, the metal, metal surface is a, is a sort of a compact lens. So is it, uh, is it, does it work in, uh, I mean, in the deep UV uh, spiritual region? Because I, I, I'm working on uh, wide band gap semiconductors. So this kind of material. So I think is it possible uh, working on the uh, short wavelength uh, spectrum range? So if, if so, so what's the challenge? Okay, so if we wanted to scale down what we were looking at, it would need to, you know, that, that's where the geometry would start to be a challenge in terms of size, but also the material, um, the behaviour of some of the materials down in the ultraviolet becomes a challenge. But there are, uh, there have been, uh, there has been work on um, materials for, you know, plasmonic applications in the UV. So um, there's potential in that space. There's also, um, I think there's been some nice work done on um, metamaterials for the UV, which were of the multi-layer, you know, hyperbolic multi-layer type of materials. And that might be a more appropriate if you wanted to go down into the UV, particularly if you're looking at some of these, um, you know, wide band gap 2D type materials, there might be some interesting, um, you know, scope in, in, in that space. But yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, an interesting challenge and um yeah okay great thank you uh thanks so another one more question uh is uh my understanding is that is the metal surface is normally is made by metals right so and the light absorption could be a problem so for the normally for the imaging uh intensity or the re resolution they have a kind of trade-off so how to uh, solve this kind of trade-off? Okay, so there's a lot of work being done on dielectric alternatives to these um, rather than plasma. So we've been looking at plasmonics and that's just something we've been looking at. 
we're starting to look at dielectric structures and, in fact, the uh, centre of excellence that Lan and I are in, uh, there's a lot of work going on in the, the dielectric uh, meta meta surface space. Um, so th does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Jen Dong. Are there any more questions from our panel list? If not, now I'm going to move actually our camera to the to the on site. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. especially the pictures looks so beautiful yeah here we have the audience here we have some questions okay yeah you ready okay please uh, thank you professor and a uh, very exciting talk uh, i just wondering uh, did you consider to uh, collaborate with industrial companies on commercialization thank you yeah, look we have considered that but we haven't been able to identify a a partner at this point, so we would love to to work with a company. So, um, if there's anyone watching this who wants to wants to have a chat, I'd be more than happy. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alice. So yeah, we, we may still have about five minutes. So I might just ask a very general questions like uh, uh, to Anne as well, or um, a general actually technical question. I've, you know, read, read so many different papers and including your talks that there's so many different types of matter service design. Um, and you talk about asymmetry is very important, uh, you know, the, uh, the, important aspect to, to achieve all this space contrast, the polarization and sensitive design. So is there any rule of, rule of thumb of design? I, I always fascinated by how people come up with these interesting little <laughs> structures, the sometimes quite, quite complex structure matter surface. This is a, I was always wondering how people come up with this kind of design. Of course, obviously gratings and all this are very commonly used, but and then there are also some quite, um, interesting structures. So I was just wondering as a, you know, uh, optics, you know, scientist or physicist, how you come up with this design? Okay, so um, I guess one way, I mean, the, there's this big picture kind of approach where you, if you think, um, and I guess Tim, Tim Davis, my collaborator, uh, who's sort of done a lot of work in this space, looking at, if you think about your, these little rods as being little dipoles, and uh, how they interact with each other and how you can interrogate them. Um, you can actually tune that in various ways using um, knowledge of, of just how that would behave. And um, to that end, he um, developed this, he and Daniel Gomez had developed this um, electrostatic kind of approximate model for doing it, which on one level, you know, it's an approximation that's kind of... Um, you know, people query the adequacy of it for the, you know, the types of geometries. However, it's been surprisingly effective at designing a whole whole range of things. I just talked about this this one device, but um, Tim and co-workers have come up with a whole lot of other things as well. And we've also developed a, a, um, a uh, so his, his system looks at just um, the, what's going on with the unit cell, but we've extended it to a, uh, a more, um, mode matching technique where we can have um, take into account um, the periodicity of the structure, so how the unit cells are interacting with each other, as well as incorporating a wave guiding layer. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, that, again, that's a sort of quasi-analytic kind of method that can be very quickly used to, to tune things. It's good to have some understanding of how these things behave before you dive in there because you could say, okay, well, let's put these particles here and see what happens. Um, 
The other thing, and, and this is uh, happening increasingly in um, meta-optic design, is using optimization algorithms where people just let things go. They go, okay, I want this behavior, just go in there. And some of these um, uh, algorithms, they, they produce some really unusual looking uh, structures where it's very difficult. It, it would have been very difficult to second guess the behavior of those devices uh, at the beginning. So I, I think there might be a little bit more back and forth in that going forward, but um, but it's it's really interesting just to see how widely these um, algorithms are being used to generate structures. It's a bit like weird looking learning. structures. Yeah, it's a bit like a machine learning whatever technique. Oh, like that. a whole you know whatever yeah. you want to call it. There's very machine learning, a whole lot of other optimization <laughs> techniques. And we I mean, you know, we're starting to. Everyone else seems to be doing it, so we're starting to work That's on right. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, I think I just have a final question. That's Actually, just, just, just one one little thing about that, though, is that we're playing around with some optimization on that um, that optical routing device. So mm -hmm. uh, the students uh, stuck it into the algorithm. And they wanted a device that had certain performance or whatever, and it actually just came up with the same design. Ah. That's which is reassuring <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> yeah okay I, I think we do have uh, just one minute for last question um a very general question I've, you've been very successful as a female scientist uh, physicist in the field and uh, do you have any advice to actually the young you know researcher scientists working in optics field it's a very exciting field at the moment so what's your advice Oh, look, I think if I look back and um, when I was younger, um, I think, um, you know, a lot of uh, women have this sort of imposter syndrome, uh, you know, lack of confidence. And I think, um, you know, I'd encourage um, particularly young women to be, you know, put themselves forward. They may feel very uncomfortable about doing it, but, um, you know, it's, you know, yeah. Scientists are very happy to talk to people. Um, you might feel like, you know, no one want to talk to you, but that's far from the truth. People will want to talk to you and want to know what you're doing and uh, are very interested to help you and um, help you progress your career. So I guess it's about, you know, um, thinking about overcoming that lack of confidence to um make sure that you, you know, network effectively and um, put yourself out there. Great. Well, thank you very much. I can't agree more. So I think that's all I have today for today. So finally, let me just um, do a bit of yeah formality <laughs> again. So, okay. So first I would like to thank you mm -hmm. again and for joining us to the, uh, today for the ICANX Talks and especially at holiday time, so and it's very late for you, I know as well. But, uh, yeah, representing ICANX, thank you very much. And I would like to present this um, certificate, which will be delivered to you by email very soon. <laughs> and hopefully, one day we can actually have you uh, to do face to face talk. And of course, next week will be the last talk of this month, and that will be um, pre. Um, presented by um, Professor, this, our speaker will be Professor Bradley Nelson uh, from ETH Zurich, and he'll be talking about the robotics part of the micro and nano robots. So please tune in next week for this um, ICANX talk next week. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. And uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.